Right. Here we go. I was on the phone with Frank. He's going crazy about these game bat stuff. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome in to the Camwood Live. It's Thursday again. So it's us. Hope you're all doing well. Still have some folks joining in, so we'll kind of give it a minute. I will say people are starting to actually communicate inside the Discord finally. So I yeah, think Discord's starting to a little scared. <laughs> starting to open up a little bit. So hopefully everybody has some questions. Y'all see me parenting over here. Get in your seat. Um anyways, we um I haven't seen a lot today? more. Yeah, Abigail's in here today. Daddy daughter. Um, does. Yeah, daughter. Boss. <laughs> Bring your kid to work. But um, like Trey said, the Discord has been popping a little bit more. A lot of questions are coming in. Um, it is a great asset. The, the Discord is almost almost like text message in a sense, being able to get, get a hold of us very quickly. So make sure that if you're not already involved in that, you can access the Discord through um, the link inside of your uh, Camwood program page. So be sure to do that. If you have any pressing questions right off the bat, we'll go ahead and, and do as normal, allow you to type those questions in the chat box or raise your hand and um, you can ask us questions, whichever one you'd prefer. Um, with each day that goes by, we're getting closer and closer to people's season. We know a lot of the folks up north kind of have a later start just depending on weather and things like that. But for the most part, everybody down south is, is just about getting into full swing. I know Brian, his son's playing um, rec ball here at the uh, recreational facility in town. So they're, they're starting up. He's eight years old. So just about all the way up and down the, the levels, kids are getting ready to play. So now's the time to ask those questions for sure. You want to make sure that you understand what's going on. Um, any misconceptions you have, uh, we'd be more than happy to clarify that, those kind of things for you now. So I'm gonna post in the Discord that we're live. Get some people in there. Do do do. There you go. But I'll tell you the one thing I like the most about that Discord is um, obviously having access to the professional players. You know, Wes is in there uh, uploading videos of his guys doing the infield drills from the infield program and all that. So it's really good to be able to see. Uh, you know, professional players doing the same drills that you are. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. What you yeah. can compare with how they look doing the drills and how your son or how you were looking doing the drills, your daughter. <clears throat> so I'm posting right now. Out of the folks that, uh, that are in here right now, how many baseball players uh, or parents to softball parents do we have? And there's a uh, there's a new segment that me and Wes are going to be or that Wes is going to be working on is uh, I think this will be really good if we can get a bunch of these pro guys on video um, doing their cage routines you know before yeah. practice before a game and because you know every player is different they have their own little different routine and I don't know why they do it that way I think right. it'd be good to have a lot of insight on that normal people aren't going to have access to it. I just posted in the Discord. Let's see. Yeah, for those of you just joining us, welcome in. Uh, this is a time for you to ask us questions in regards to any of the programs that you're going through, whether it be part one, part two, um, the infield program, any of that stuff. Um, we're basically here for you. We want to help clarify all of your misconceptions if you have any and make sure that everybody is where they need to be understanding wise to take their kids through these programs. We're continuing to hear um, lots of results. There was a text that we sent back and forth. I think it was last night or maybe this morning that Trey sent us one from the discord of a parent talking about um, their eight year old kid, um, how they've basically implemented the program. He's been through the program. They have practice and his kid gets up to his station it's time for him to hit and he starts swinging and it's i mean 
you got parents standing around literally in awe of, of an eight year old swing. Um, and that just goes to show you that the stuff we teach, it, it is translatable and transferable to kids of all ages. Uh, if they're old enough to stand there and kind of look at you for five minutes and listen to you, you can teach them parts of this program and the concepts of this swing uh, that, that we harp on all the time. They can understand it a lot better than people give them credit for, for sure. That's, that's the thing is we, I tried to really simplify this program and this process to where anybody can understand it. And I said that I'd say it all pretty much every week. I say this, it's not necessarily the swing mechanics. It's what they're thinking about while they're doing the drills. You know, that's where we're seeing the biggest difference is if we can change that player's mindset while they're doing the drills, it's going to fix their mechanics. And mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure I'm not the only person that teaches that. I've yet to see an instructor in the cage break down. Okay. What are you thinking while you're doing this type thing? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because most instructors are just going to grab the bat and show you, I want you to do this without, you know, telling you how to do it or showing you, you know, like a drill that will teach you how to do it. And that's what we do. We come in, simplify the process so you understand the mechanics and it's easy to replicate. And that's why we're seeing such good results with this program is because it's so easy for a player to come in, understand what they need to do and, you know, accomplish what they're trying to do. Yeah. I mean, you said the word right there, process. That's the biggest thing that we harp on in here truthfully is because a lot of folks a lot of hitting coaches and players too they get so locked into the result and what the end result what they want the end result to be and they never take time to stop and think about how you really get that end result I mean we can stand here with the swings that we have and the kids that we've I mean that have gone through this program and they can consistently hit the ball just about all in the same they can hit in the same exact spot on the net because it's not moving. Their consistency of being able to take the same path to the same ball is, is just, un, I mean, it's, it's impeccable. And so, I mean, a lot of times if we get too focused on the results, all we're, all we're swinging and looking at the ball and we haven't even took time to think about how are we getting to the point of contact? Is, is the process of what I'm doing really helping me get the result I want to get? And more people from the room. Um, this is a story from earlier. I think it was last week. No, what's today? Thursday. This was Monday. We had a, a couple softball players, high school softball players in here. Um, one of them has been through the program probably six months ago and kind of, you know, typical first time people, they go through the program and then you don't see them for a little while. She had, a, I mean, she was a freshman in high school, so she didn't play a lot. She didn't, I mean, her need to work wasn't really there because she wasn't getting a lot of a lot of reps. So anyway, she comes back and we're putting balls on the tee and her and her teammate are standing there. They hit off the tee with their game bat and they are consistently barreling up balls. Now their swings are real. I mean, bats vertical through the zone, real high finish. And we go through, we let them hit. And the first thing I said to them, I said, OK, so tell me, I mean, good or bad, do you feel good or bad about the swings you just took and they said I mean they felt pretty good and I said yes that's that I would too because in, if I had closed my eyes and just listened I had no complaints in your swing I mean it sounds like you're barreling the ball every time but the ball is sitting still you can do that every single time when the ball's sitting still the only reason y'all are in here is because this stuff it's transferring into the game you're not able to get those kind of results in a game there's a reason why that's what we're going to work on that's what we have to get you to understand is when I do miss in a game there's a reason why if I don't understand how my swing was off and be able to feel how my swing was off I'm not going to be able to fix it so I mean there again really go through these programs guys you cannot do them enough you can't learn this stuff enough you'll never be able to really master it yeah I did I did these drills pretty much every day for six years straight you know before practice before games I was always doing drills Looks like we got we got a, ran, a hand raised here. Yeah, I got cut off on accident. <clears throat> yeah, Matt, what's up, man? Hey, how's it going, guys? Good, what's up, buddy. Good, good. Hey, um, I know we've talked about y'all talked about this before, but um, just in in season. So high school, right? High school or, or middle school ball, whichever. 
but in season, um, I know every day is very important, but, uh, I mean, is it, is it really, I mean, my theory has been, you know, even if it's 15 to 20 minutes is better than nothing. Right. Um, Absolutely. I, I'm just kind of picking your brains on in season and just around, you know, some of these guys are playing seven games a week sometimes. Right. So they're very busy and I get it, but I don't know. I just, what, what are you seeing? What are you doing? How are they doing it? Um, well, let, let me ask you this matter. Are you a parent or just, or just a parent or a parent and a coach or one yeah, or the I'm, other? I'm a, I'm a little of both. A little of both. Okay. Um, basically, I mean, a lot of times, I mean, for Trey, when I met Trey, Trey was in college. So I watched Trey do this mainly through college, which he was at the end of his high school career when he started. Um, yeah. We didn't have too much of a warm-up routine as a team. Every, I mean, if it was game day, um, practice day, really getting yourself loose was kind of up to you. We had stuff that we did at practice, which obviously wasn't Camwood related stuff, but we had stuff yeah. we did at practice, but it was very important um, that we got our work in, whether it be before or after. And like you said, even if it's 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, if you, if your stamina can let you go longer than that, then by all means do. Yeah. But the number one thing is to make sure that your muscle memory remembers the right way to do it every day um yep obviously you say they, they're playing seven games a week i had somebody reach out to us uh yesterday or day before in the hotline that was talking about their kid's schedule um and he was a young kid and i mean their schedules are unbelievably busy if you especially if you're playing school ball and travel ball um in an honest opinion i would be very careful not to let those kids wear themselves out um, it is possible. I have seen this too many times. Kids play, 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 play at a young age. And by the time they're 17, 18 years old, they're so tired of playing. They have no desire to pick a baseball up the rest of their life. Some of the best players that I've ever seen, especially in my town, are walking around town right now not playing because of stuff like that. So make sure that you don't wear them out. But if they have seven games a week, do their best four or five days a week to find time to get those drills in. They need to go through all four. They need to make sure that their hands are good. I mean, don't forget weight shift. Don't forget pipe. Um, but try to find you a little routine. Our routine is literally like it is in the program. One-handers, two-handers, weight shift, pipe, right down the sheet. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's kind of my take on it there. Well, yeah. I, uh, it's high school. and I say that it's probably five to – I mean, they play on a Tuesday and then, you know, if they do JV yeah. and varsity, I mean, it, it can right. be seven games a week. It, so, I, no I, doubt. I want them to do it, but at the same time, you know, I let them kind of pick and choose. I, I don't – you know, I mean, he's – You don't beat him over of, the head, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, he he um, he um knows it works. <laughs> that's right. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's stuff that you can – I mean, you can kind of police yourself. I mean, if he goes yeah. – Say you just kind of let him do his thing, and if he hits a little bit of a low, I mean a low point where he's struggling a little bit, yeah. I mean the answer is going to probably be that. How much are you doing your drills? I mean, how often yeah. are you getting them in? And if the answer is not enough, then all right, then that's that's a learning point for him. Now he understands it does work, but I have to keep doing it. I have got to find time to get that in at some point during the day. Yeah, I kind of tell him it's just like golf. Those guys, you know how many swings they take. Oh, in practice yeah. to hit 65 oh, good shots in a round of mm-hmm. it's, yep. it's they the play 18 thing. holes and then go to the range yeah, <laughs> yeah. so yeah it's unbelievable um no i mean it it it's i can see it i can i can see it and then lastly i kind of let him pick and choose his drills like we try to run mm-hmm. through all four but i leave it open to him how many he wants to do right right i'm, I'm, I'm yep. hoping 20 of each whatever mm-hmm. but between picking his bat, wood bat, regular bat, um, I let him feel it out and kind of go back and forth. I just, I now I just right. sit back and put the ball on the tee. So yeah. that's right. I mean, Is and that it okay? gets to that point. Yeah, absolutely. It gets to that point. I mean, especially for kids. I mean, we've seen that with some of our older kids. The longer they go, the the more they understand it. And I mean, I'm not needed. I mean, I can stand here and load it on the tee every now and then. I could call it. I can. I can tell you what you did wrong before you do. But if, yeah. if you give them time, they'll figure it out. I mean, if he he puts I mean, your loading balls on the tee and he feels good after 10 or 12 swings and wants to move to the next drill, then, I mean, 
let him fill it out. Let him learn. He, I mean, 10 or 12 may work for a week, and then yeah. it may not work the next week. He has to do 15 or 20 the next week. So it's yeah. really going to be up to him at that point for sure. Okay. All right. Well, just picking your brain. So outside of that right now, nothing more than just maintenance during the season. Get in what you can. Mm-hmm. Nothing too official, bat speed or anything else. I mean, we've we've made our gains. Now we're just trying yeah. to maintain, right? Now so you're right trying now. to let it show. Yeah, now you're trying to put it put it in the game. Yeah, now you're trying to show everybody what you've been working on. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, guys. I know you've said it before. I just wanted to confirm my, my thinking. No problem, yeah. man. I'll, I'll tell you with me, you know, before games, before practice, I'd go in there. And obviously our program, you know, you could be in the cage for up to an hour doing the drills. So obviously before a game, <coughs> you don't want to get tired out. So you don't want to do that many swings. So yeah. I'd go in there. I start with my one hand drill. We'll start with the basics. I do 10, 15 swings. If I'm, if I'm consistent, I'm feeling good. Okay. I move on to the next drill. If I'm consistent with the no feet, no shoulders with the big bat, then I move on to the next one, so on and so forth. But yeah. you know, there's days where you have it and there's days when you don't, you know, mm-hmm. so say I'm doing the one hand drill and after 10 swings, I've messed up on five out of the 10. Well, now I'm going to sit and focus on a little bit more, right? And I'm yeah. going to correct that before I move on to the next thing. And I'm a little bit more hard-nosed about it personally. I'm, you do these drills before practice every day. You show up 20 minutes early, you get the drills in. And that's all it yeah. takes. Yeah. So, um, you know, I was working with a player in high school. I was working with four or five different guys at the high school next to me. And we, we did the 30-day program. And then the season started. It was like their second game of the season. And I didn't tell the kids I was coming. So I showed up to the game about 45 minutes early to see which of my kids were in there doing the Mm -hmm. drill before. Yeah. One of the four showed up and I chewed those other three out whenever they did show up. One of them showed up with his girlfriend right before the game started. Yeah. And, um, you know, you just have to make that switch. And once I got it into those kids' heads that they needed to come in here and do this stuff to warm up before the game, then their number started increasing. I run. I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? You put the work yeah. in before your numbers start going up. So, you know, I look at it as it's kind of like going to the gym. If you go to the gym to max out, you know, you warm up to get to that top weight, right? Mm-hmm. So just like going to the game, you need to warm up and get your drills in before you get into the game because it's going to reiterate those uh, that muscle memory and those mechanics and that consistency. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, and then – La- my last question or comment in your opinion pre-game i mean look you can get in the cage and hit bp on the field which to me you're trying to you almost get your adrenaline adrenaline going and you're trying to impress people right with bp so mm-hmm. my thought is you know what if you just did your drills before the game and step into the box um do, do you i mean i'm just picking your brain do you have a feel for that yeah i know if with me um and BP, a lot of people can get big headed. They're trying to hit the ball as far as they possibly can. Oh yeah. And I'll tell you, sometimes I get in there and I try to, you know, impress a scout that might be in stand <laughs> like that. But no, like, and Jonathan will tell you, the first round of my BP was always hard ground balls to the right to the opposite field. And the reason for that is because I wanted to work on my mechanics and keep my front shoulder from flying open. So your top hitters go watch their BP. They they have a process. They have a routine. And nine times out of ten, like their first four or five rounds are them hitting hard line drives that are this high off the ground into the gaps. And it's because they're yeah. focusing on the mechanics staying inside the ball. So yeah. me personally, when I'm hitting BP, every single round has a purpose. And I'm focusing on staying inside the ball. So if I'm watching one of my kids and they hit an outside pitch and they pull it, I'm jumping all over them. You know, you're yeah. not staying inside the ball. That You came around that ball. That's why you just hit a ground ball to the third baseman. And that's an easy out. You got to yep. take that outside pitch, stay inside the ball, and drive it to the gap. So, in my perspective, BP is a routine, and it's a process just like in the cages are. I mean, you can let loose and have fun on maybe your last round, but we're still focusing on staying inside the ball. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Okay, thanks, guys. Yes, sir, man. All right. And that's something, too, Trey, that, I mean, we'll kind of stay on for a minute. Like, I mean, you know this as well as I do. Kids don't really – they can lose a lot of focus when they go from cage work to the game or cage work to BP. I mean, it is, you have to be that kind of focused. You have to, I mean, we're so tough on kids in here when they don't do it right because you, you have to want to do it right every single time in order for it to work in the game. I mean, if you're not 
if you go work in the cage and then you go to BP and you just swing, 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 well, that's what's going to show up in the game. That's exactly what's going to happen in the game. You're not going to get the swing that you have in the cage. If you're not that focused in BP, I mean, you think whatever you want in a game, it's not going to work. You've got to be able to apply it in the cage, take that mental focus, those that muscle memory, transfer it to BP, same thing, transfer it over to the game, and then let it play out. So that's what I love about watching Miguel Cabrera. Miguel Cabrera is my favorite hitter. So I've, I've watched a lot of his videos. Go watch his BP. I mean, it is smooth. Mm-hmm. And they throw the ball in the outside part of the plate or down the middle. He's keeping the hands inside the ball. And he's hitting a hard line drive to the opposite field because he's just working on, you know, that just folks on staying inside that ball because he knows right. if he comes around the ball, that's where he's going to start getting in trouble in games. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, he'll show off and hit one four fifty, but majority of that BP is staying inside the ball, hitting hard line drives into the gaps, and that's basically all your good hitters. I mean, go watch. Yeah, all that's your good every hitters. one of them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, BP allows hitters to slow down what's happening in the game at the most realistic level. I mean, it's the only what it's the only time that the motion of the I mean, the motion of the pitcher, the I mean, plane of the pitch, all that stuff kind of matches what it's going to do in the game. So if you don't have a lot of focus when you can slow it down, I don't care how much focus you have when it speeds up. Your muscle memory is just going to revert back to what you did then. So, I mean, you've got to make sure we're always focused on <laughs> staying inside the ball, having good mechanics, no matter whether it's T, cage, BP, whatever. Um, so then you can get in the game and not have to think. I mean, if you could get in the game and all you have to think about is see the pitch, make sure it's a strike, and be ready to drive it hitting is a lot easier than it than it normally is i remember frank brought the point up to me when i was in high school <clears throat> and you know a lot of high school players they lose their mental I and mean, college mm-hmm. players do too where mm-hmm. you know you're in a game your team is up by 10 or down by 10 and you're at bat really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of games so you just go mm-hmm. there trying to hit the ball as far as you possibly can right yeah just so playing around. You basically just not at bat well, how many at-bats do you get in a season? You know, say in high school you get 200 at-bats. Well, that's five points on your average right there. If you go and just throw in that bat away and you're just trying to pull and hit the ball as far as you possibly can, think of that's five points. Say you do that five times during the entire season, which five times is not a lot. A lot of players mm-hmm. do way more than that. That's 25 points that you just literally threw away. And whenever Frank put it in that perspective to me, I was like, okay, no matter what, like I have got to focus mm-hmm. every single on that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, I mean, that's something, too, that I think. I mean, and we could be on this for days, but you bringing up the the point system, I mean, every at-bat that you throw away is five points on your average. I mean, if your average goes down, your, your status as a good hitter is going down as well. I mean, the lower your batting average is, the less good of a hitter you are. Um, somebody, I saw somebody on Instagram post something the other day about how great hit, no great hitter has repeatable swings. The hitter that they put in the video hit 256 last year. That's not a great hitter, folks. That's 250. That is not consi- that's not consistent. I mean, we're looking at 280, 290, 300, 310. That's that's where you want to be. So, I mean, good hitters have consistent repeatable swings. Go watch Miguel Cabrera. Go watch. I mean, yeah, go, watch Trey go watch I Trey Turner. Go watch Trey Turner. Man, he, I, Brian it. asked me, or a kid in here asked me the other day who I thought the best player in the league is right now. I said Trey Turner. All around, if I got to pick one guy I want on my team, Trey Turner. He can hit – he can do it all. Five tools right there. I mean, that dude is just unbelievable at staying inside the ball and keeping the bat in the way. Another question hey. right here in the chat box. In the chat Got three of them, and they. Um, this is from Coach Garcia. We are into the third month of practices, preseason with this team. As every team, we have had about three kids or so that are not implementing the Cam Wood teaching in flips or BP. Yep, that's going to be typical. Off the tee, they're inconsistent. Do you just switch the focus into just compete and hit the ball hard or keep pushing the Cam Wood idea? We are three weeks from first round, Robin. Okay. Um, honestly, if I've got, for example, I got a team of 12, 15 kids, and all of those kids except for three are buying into what we're doing and what we're doing, what we're teaching really works, then those three kids that don't want to buy into it, they're going to understand that they're basically 
if you don't want to buy in, then, I mean, you can be on the team, but, I mean, your opportunities are going to be very limited because, number one, what we teach works. Number two, if you're going to be a part of a team, part of a team is buying into the mission of the team. And, obviously, you've adopted the Camwood mission as, as, as y'all's hitting philosophy. Um, so, I, like you said, they're inconsistent off the tee. Um, they're probably just as inconsistent in BP and flips and things like that. Um, they're not wanting to even implement the stuff in flips or BP. That tells me those kids really don't want to be there. Um, they really don't want to improve their swing. And when those kids get opportunities um, with the swings that they have right now, the results are going to show that they're not working, that they're not trying to improve. And it's going to just almost solidify, I mean, their reason to not be in the lineup. I mean, as, as brutal as that kind of sounds, as harsh as that may sound, that's as honest as I can be. I mean, I coached high school for three years, and I've dealt with that. My gosh, I dealt with that every single day. Um, and it was a whole lot more than three kids. I mean, it was the first time they'd ever, ever seen Cam Wood. They didn't, wasn't sure of it, didn't really want it. And you kind of got to let them, in a sense, do what they want to do. But, again, they play on your team. So um, if those kids that are implementing the Cam Wood system, if they're – improving if they're seeing results if they're getting better then those kids are earning opportunities right off the jump for sure and that's the other thing is you know a lot of people say the camwood system the camwood way like it's not i mean it implies it's, that it's, it's a bad that came up with this like yeah we learned this philosophy from the great hitters of that ever played the game you know raw crew tony glenn all those guys so this isn't something that we came up with and like i said if some of your players don't want to swing a camwood bat that's fine. I don't really care. But they need to focus on the proper mechanics of staying inside the ball. I mean, regardless, whether you use our bat or someone else's bat or just a regular game bat, I don't care. They need to learn how to stay inside the ball and focus on staying inside the ball because that's how you're going to have the proper mechanics. So staying inside the ball is not – that's not the – I mean, obviously that's what we harp on and what we preach, but that's not something we came up with, right? You know, this is something that – players forever have been have done and all your great players talk about how important it is to stay inside the ball yeah. so like i said if you got guys on your team that don't want to buy into the cam with way they don't want to swing that funky looking bat that's fine but mechanic wise they need to learn and focus on how to stay inside the baseball yeah absolutely um question here uh does the Camwood philosophy mean bottom hand dominant swing i wouldn't necessarily say that it means bottom hand dominant but um, I mean, the bottom hand leads the swing. That's where we start teaching. If our bottom hand goes the right direction and everything else behind it's going to follow that way. So uh, the top hand does have a part to play. It is making the bat lighter. It is helping the bat stay up. So we do use the top hand, but we want to make sure that we start with the one-hander to teach the bottom hand how to take the proper path. Yeah, with well, the top if hand. I had to be, if I had to be more dominant one way or the other, I would want to be more – I'd, I'd want to be more bottom hand dominant. I was not that way. Yeah. That's the whole yeah. problem. Is obviously, <clears throat> the, the top hand can become a liability in the swing. Because if you're top hand dominant, you're going to sit there and roll over pretty much everything. So, like Frankie used to always tell me, the top hand is just a guide. It's along for the ride. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it, it, it gives you that support and all that. And it gives you a little extra power when you're driving through the zone and all that stuff. But if you're a top hand dominant player, your mechanics are going to break down. So that's why Frank always harped on me releasing at contact with that top hand, because if you're releasing that contact with that top hand, you're taking that out of your swing pretty much. You're taking out that factor of rolling over with it. So, and that's why you'll see, you know, 90, 95% of big leaguers and professional players all top hand release because mm -hmm. A, they don't want to be top hand dominant. So it eliminates that aspect of the swing and B, they want to get that extra extension out front. So like you said, if between the two, like I said, I mean, you can say it's bottom hand dominant, but I mean, your bottom hand does majority of your swing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, top hand yeah. can, it just, it's a liability in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, here's another one. My daughter plays softball off the tee. Uh, she can hit the ball hard. She's 14 in practice. She's hit a, uh, over, she's hit home runs over 220 foot fence, but in a game, everything is weak grounders to the left side. She's right handed, can't stay back tries to pull everything, how can I break her of this habit? Um, Trey was the same way. 99% uh, of players are this way. Starting out, they get a good swing, they improve their swing, and now they cannot wait to see that ball jump in a game. We really have to slow down our mental process 
Um, if her approach is wanting to pull, 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 or hit the ball more to the left side of the field, um, that's, that's the reason why she's pulling everything on the ground because she's way out in front. She's out and around. She's got to really slow the game down and see the ball out of the pitcher's hand, let the ball travel. She thinks about the contact point that we have when we put the ball on the tee. It's right in line with her front foot. So, I mean, if she's starting when the pitch just comes out of the pitcher's hand, it's not going to be in line with the front foot by the time it gets there. So we've got to start that later. I mean, find that rhythm to where I can have my front foot down and be ready to get my swing there at contact. Um, but the number one key is going to be approach. Her approach has got to get more to the opposite field uh, rather than inside. If she's thinking in, she's going to be already gone, and now she can't reach the outside pitch. When it's out there, that's where we go. Hands go out and around. Yeah, and like it's I said, when on the outside, break. you get off the end of the bat a lot too, I bet. So, I mean, it's yeah. like weak ground ball for the third baseman or the shortstop. And like yeah. I said, it's, it's really all approach. It's She's trying to pull everything. So, right when the pitcher lets go of the ball, all her mechanics are going out to try to pull that ball to the left side. Not my stuff over. But um, yeah. an easy way to do this, an easy way I teach my players approach is we set up a front toss, and I toss everything outside, 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 outside. They're, all they're focusing on is taking that outside pitch and driving it to the opposite field gap. And then every now and then I'll bust it inside just to see what their approach is because I'm teaching them think away, drive away, react inside. Mm -hmm. So I, I promise you, if you think away, drive away, and they throw you an inside fastball, you're, you're just going to react. And it's simple and easy. You're, you're still going to barrel that ball up and crush it, right? But if you're thinking pull and they throw you outside, you are completely screwed. There's nothing you can yeah. do. And especially if it's an off-speed pitch to the outside, you're not even going to come close to touching that ball. So yeah, I would get in the cage with her and say, "I'm going to throw. I'm going to toss these on the outside part of the plate. Focus on keeping the hands inside the ball and driving it to the opposite field. I would do six, seven straight on the outside, and then not even tell her, bust her inside and see what she does because you mm -hmm. want to teach that reaction. So." <clears throat> You know, and if she starts, and I had a player the other day say that they're rolling over to the left side a lot. Um, they're righty. They're hitting the ball, a lot of ground balls at their baseman. And the reason for that is because their lower half wasn't getting there on time. The lower half was late. And whenever your lower half is late, the hands come out around the ball. So, you know, that could also be another reason why she's hitting ground balls to the left side is the lower half is not getting the proper rotation to allow the hands to work inside the ball. Mm -hmm. That's where we would just need to, you know, a video, you know, we just explained the two most common reasons for why they uh, hit ground balls to the full side. So you would know which yeah. one more affects her. But <clears throat> I said it would be nice to see a video of that so we can tell exactly what the issue is. Yeah. Very a lot good. Of time approach. That was my issue. I had yeah, a I mean, I mean that's, that's, I think that's everybody's <laughs> issue. I mean, honestly, I honestly that's do. Good. I mean, you know how hard it was. Even – even when you were grooving, it was still difficult at times to, to let that ball travel. I mean, sometimes you're anxious. Sometimes, I mean, you feel like you've got this dude or this pitcher red. And, I mean, you are no, you know you're going to crush it. So, it takes a lot of discipline um, for your mind to really control your body and make it let the ball travel. Make it stay controlled, let the ball get there, and then send it. So, yeah, that should help her. If she can fix that mental game, that'll – That'll turn it around for sure. Oh, that's when it's, I became a completely different hitter. That's when I became a complete hitter is once I mm -hmm. realized I can take that ball off of just as easy as I yeah. can pull it. And then I can point, think that way. I was a to you, you know, because, I mean, if you're trying to pull everything, very easy for me to see that, especially at a college level. A college mm -hmm. pitcher is going to see that, and you're going to be screwed because they're going to know exactly how to pitch to you. Yeah. Very good. Any <laughs> other questions, guys? Ladies and gentlemen, that was, that was the main thing with, uh, I'll say just a little quick story of, um, you know, I went and hit in the cage with Judd Fabian, who's an all American outfielder for the university of Florida right now. He, um, you know, last season he hit like 16, 17 home runs, but he hit like 240 with a lot of strikeouts. So I'm in the cage with him and I said, like, no, what are you, what are you thinking at the plate? And he was like, well, my, my coach told me to just try to pull everything and hit the ball out of the ballpark to the pool side. And I was like, well, I can definitely tell that because your strikeouts are like 30 something percent and you're hitting 240, but you hit 17 home runs. 
So <clears throat> you watch a lot of his at bats. And if I know a player is going to try to pull everything, I'm going to bust him inside with fastballs early in the count and he's just going to hit him foul. So even like I've seen videos of Judd get that inside fastball, he hits it a mile, but it's foul every time, right? So now that he's down late in the count, hit off speed away, no way he's going to touch it because he's trying to pull everything. So easy strikeouts. So this season, after, you know, I talked with them and they talked with the coach, I was like, okay, we're going to open it up. We're going to hit it to all parts of the field. Well, I just saw an at-bat the other night from Judd. You know, he hit – I think he's got six home runs now and four of the six are up, though. But he uh, he got busted way inside on an inside fastball. I mean, it was off the plate. It was way in on him. Last season, that's pulled 500 feet foul. This year, because he's staying inside the ball and he's focusing away and reacting in, he hit at the left center like 450 feet. And I texted his dad. His dad sent me a video of it, and I texted him back, and I said, last year that's a foul ball. And all his dad was said is, you're correct. Like, that's what the approach will do for you. It's drive – you know, you're thinking away, drive away, just react in. But no matter what, we stay inside the baseball. Take that approach, you're going to become a complete hitter. Judd will hit 350. He'll still hit his 14, 15 home runs this year, and he's going to get drafted in the first round just because he made that small switch in his approach this year. Mm -hmm. um, do we feel the, do you feel the batter shifts his weight instead of rotate with a bottom hand dominant swing? No, we, we do not. We, I mean, and I'm assuming you're asking this. Um, do we feel that we see that happening with a bottom hand dominant swing. Um, we don't, if we teach weight shift properly, weight shift is not necessarily weight moving forward. You load the weight up into that backside, and then you use your knee to direct where that weight is going to, where that momentum is going to go. Wow. You don't necessarily, you don't, you don't move your weight. You leave it in the back and drive your knee to tell it where you want the power to go. Um, so again, make sure that when you can fix that. I mean, just focusing on a stiff front side. If they're having problems going forward in their swing, they've got to feel that front foot get on the ground and hold still. It's got to be. I mean, stiff from the hip down so that their body can't get over the front side. No, I said, whenever you're doing that, with the lower half, the, the knee drive gets your momentum going through the ball, and then you fight, a, you rotate, you fight against that front side, and that's what creates a lot of that torque in the swing. So, like I said, with me personally, I never had any issues with my weight drive going forward, but um, – you know, I had an issue with a lot of my weight coming up through the swing because obviously, you know, driving up instead of staying down through it. And that's where I would just focus on the pipe drill and just focus on the rotation part of the swing. And that fixed it right then and there. So me personally, whenever I was hitting, I focused on the rotation part of my swing more than anything because I knew that the other my weight drive and my weight shift was fine. I just needed to work on the rotation and then the hands followed through. And that's what really helped me debate the cue that helped me uh, get my lower half in the right position was more so rotational than anything. But yeah. like you're saying, bottom hand swing, your lower half is completely different. It's isolated than your upper half. Mm -hmm. And that's why in our drills, we isolate the two. It's because it's, there's two aspects to the swing. There's your upper half, then there's your front or your hip, pretty much. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So those two things, yeah. they operate separately. But the lower half allows your hands to get in the position to stay inside the ball. Very good. Another one here. My son's been working with the swing trainer strap that attaches to your bat and your arm. Would it be advisable to combine that with the Camwood off the tee? Our Camwood is uh, coming in the mail, and we're excited to get started using it. Um, I, I'm, I mean, don't we talk, think of attached to it, for one. But, Say that again. I don't think the I don't think the cam wood will attach to that because of the knob. I don't know if it will either. That was my next thought. Um, I don't know if right. it'll attach to that to that <laughs> trainer, but never nevertheless, I mean, um, I'm assuming this is the one that's. I mean, you pull the, the swing rail thing. Okay, swing rail. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna see a lot more strength gains with the cam wood than you would that. Um, the swing rail we do. I mean, we mentioned this. I think it was last week. Um, the concept of what it's trying to teach, I think, is the same. It's, I mean, it's wanting you to keep the hands closed, move them inside the ball, um, but it creates more of a, like a snatchy motion rather than a drive 
Um, so I would just pay attention to that. Make sure that when, even when they're using that swing rail, that they're driving their hands, not snatching them down and out of that, out of that strap. Yeah, the thing that I can see is that they would fly open with their front shoulder to try to open it up and get it out of the rail type thing. But I'll tell you right, personally, I've never used it. Um, would I use it? No, but I'm not going to sit here and knock someone else's product either. So I'm like, I can't really speak yeah. too much to it. They're trying to teach the right concept of staying inside the ball, so that I like. Um, I just wouldn't know if I would ever use it as a training tool in order to get there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So. Very good. Hope that helps you there a little bit. Any other questions? I think we got a hand raised right here. Matt again. But I, think he's, I think I don't know if he's trying to talk again or I can't either. He left and then he come back. Hello. You What's up, Matt? Question? Hey, sorry. I'm, I don't know. I don't think you're allowed two questions, but y'all said something oh, I no, want to ask. No, go ahead. Um, this is more of the mental side. So you mentioned points and average and and yeah, you don't want to waste any of bats, right? Yeah, right. Um, and I'm just thinking to when I played and all kids, I mean, how much how much focus do you think there should be on on the average and points? I know it's important, but right. I just kind of noticed when I grew up, sometimes it would it would almost make you more stressed out and you're focused on points versus the outcome. So I don't know. I'm just I'm just wondering yeah. from a mental standpoint, what do y'all what have y'all seen do think about focusing on the points and average? Right. Well, one thing I, I would make sure that I want folks to understand first off is that we're not telling you to go your whole season and pay attention to your average. Like, I mean, oh my God, I gotta get four hits today so my average goes up or so I can get to this number. <laughs> um, but we yeah. do think it's important that kids understand why that why there's numbers in baseball i mean there's there's they keep batting averages for a reason and if i want to be yeah. a good hitter then i need to be up in this area not down here in this area so yeah. knowing what i know now i was big thinking on batting average i mean i thought on my average all the time because i knew that it may i mean your batting average was what people looked at so i wanted it to be high but it did cause me a lot of stress in my in my approach in my bat things like that um Sometimes I would be streaky because of my mental, I mean, my, my mind and what I'm thinking. Um, but knowing now how the aspects of the swing play into the game, how to isolate it all the way down to the one-hander, the two-hander, and all the drills, I don't think that it's a bad thing for kids to, to think about their average. You can't get lost in it. You can't be trying to get hits to make your average go up. But if you'll understand average, why they keep average, what it means to have a good batting average, um, and understand how to achieve it. I mean, if I can keep the bat in the line, in the line of the pitch, I'm going to make contact more, which is going to allow me an opportunity to get more hits, which would make my batting average go up. So yeah. if I can – it kind of brings you all the way back to the reason why I need to be doing the drills. Because if I want to have a good batting average, if I want this stuff for my career, then these are the things I got to do to get to that level or to have a chance to get to that level. Yeah. And I, I will say, you know, to me personally, younger age, I don't give. Yeah, I don't care what they hit. I mean, not what their average is. It's yeah. we're developing at that point, right? But I guess I, with me in college, you know, a scout's coming to watch me play. Oh, yeah, we're look looking at, at that average. Boy. So, <laughs> they I mean, trade I right back on the bus talking about averages, man. We <laughs> add points and everything else. Like I said, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of mental stuff that goes with it. Like oh yeah, get to that like me personally, my goal is always one hit a game. If I can just get one hit a game, my average is going to be perfect. Because there's games I'm going to go three for four. There's games I'm going to go four for five. You know, two for five. There's games you're going to get walked so, three times and have one hit. I mean, <laughs> yeah. There, so yeah. Like I said, so, my, my goal is always you know one hit a game at least. But um, yeah. like I said, obviously at a younger age, I don't care at all about average. Because that's – I mean, no scouts coming to watch a 12-year-old kid play. So, no, no. it's more so about development and making sure they're focused on the right things at a younger age. So, as you get older, yeah, you can worry about average and stuff like that. But as – like, most of the kids that are doing this program that are, you know, 10 years old all the way up to, you know, even 15, 16, just worry about developing. I mean, if you develop yeah. properly, your average is going to show. Yeah. I mean, I harp, we harp on hitting the ball hard, too. I mean, if you just focus on, like Trey said, one, if I can get one hit a game and I can, I can hit the ball hard three out of four times today, 
I'll take my chances. I mean, and my mechanics are going to play into that. So if I can be prepared for that, if my muscle memory's there, then I allow myself to forget about batting average and relax and just see the ball and let myself do what I've trained to do. And I, I know for a fact I've, you know, it, it, this is wrong too. This is not the right mentality. But, you know, I could smoke four balls in a game and go over four and I'd be pissed. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. What do you think about, you know, I just, I put really good swings on these, you know, hit hard line drive just right at people. And that's baseball. It happens. And, you know, I'd go back yeah. to the bus and be angry as hell. And no, like now, you know, obviously that's not the right approach to have because that's. Well, just, I mean, we, we mentioned that last week too. Some, I mean, that goes into what you're judging success. I mean, if you're looking at your batting average all the time to judge success, I mean, it's going to be a tough day. It's really going to get you up here. But if you can just focus on hitting the ball hard, like Trey said, I mean, every, every baseball player is going to get aggravated when they hit one hard and somebody catches it. But in the grand scheme of things, he hit four rockets right on the nose today. He had a perfect day. There's nine people standing on the field. It's that hard to miss one of those guys. You can't really make it go somewhere. So if, as long as they're hitting it hard, they're successful. And if they'll watch their batting average, their batting average will show it. Yep. Gotcha. Yep. Thanks. So I hope that helps you there, Matt. Yep. I saw, I remember an at bat in college where, you know, I hit a I hit a really hard line drive. And the third baseman, like it just so happened to find his glove. And later in the game, he because I played first base, he got to first base. He was like, dude, I didn't even see that ball. It was hit so hard. And it literally just found his glove somehow. And stuff like that, you know, would it would get to me. Even though I smoked the damn ball, you know, it would still make me mad because I didn't get a hit at, at that point in time. So that's not really – that's not the proper approach to have while playing the game because, like you said, that will carry you over into your next at bat and the bat, mm -hmm. at bat after that. And before you know it, you're in a slump. So <coughs> – very good. Any other questions, folks? Very good. Okay. Look, uh, do we have one more hand? No, I think that's Matt's hand. Uh, will this session be recorded? Yes, it is. We will. Um, actually stop the recording here in just a few minutes when we end it but yes it will be recorded and um this one will go on youtube so you'll be able to watch it back on youtube camwood batch youtube channel um since we kind of just got there at the end batting average again we we would really highly encourage you not to get lost in it but I, it is so important that kids understand i mean they need a basis of where to judge i mean where they're at, how much better they need to get, how much they need to improve. Is, is their swing really as good as they think it is? The way, the way that's judged is through the batting average. If they understand what a good batting average is, how to have a good, good batting average, focus on staying inside the ball, hitting the ball hard, trying to get one hit a game if it's possible, they're going to be right up there where they need to be. Um, so, again, if your kids are having any – issues this week or through the weekend make sure to reach out to the camwood hotline text us or hit us up in the discord chat and we'll get those questions answered for you we appreciate your time this week guys so y'all have a great weekend and we will see you next thursday right here on the camwood live